Hi, this is Shady, and the man you are seeing in front of you is none other than Jacinto Ferro. Jacinto Ferro is a great testament to how fragile our history in the martial arts really is. Now, you see, these figures are not these like high royal political um, figures that easily a history can document them. They are rather teachers and professors that played a vital role in the birth of various stories, various martial arts, but at the same time they are not as documented as highly political figures or um, any type of figure from the past. So uh, little articles from newspapers, magazines, uh, journals from someone's diaries, um, so on and so forth can play a huge role because if it wasn't for these you would have people that are just lost in history basically like as if they never existed so um, before I start the story of uh, Jacinto Ferro please excuse my voice um, I went and got myself tested so I'm pretty sure this is what it is so um, please be patient uh, I'm trying as hard as I can to push content and a little bit of a voice problems will not stop me. So again, please forgive me for the voice. So uh, a little bit about Jacinto Ferro. So he was very athletic growing up. He had a background in cycling, boxing, wrestling, and even weightlifting, as you saw him doing uh, the clean and jerk with the 100 kilograms. So he was very, very physically active, and this is what probably pushed him to uh, try judo. So uh, he was one of the first civilians, actually, to train uh, judo from or Japanese masters because back then when the Japanese first came to the country they were teaching mainly combatives to law enforcement police uh, the armies uh, veterans so on and so forth so um, the courses would be uh, very similar to police training basically so it wasn't very much available to um, the civilians so Yasinto was actually one of the first uh, to wanting to go and train judo for personal development and also self-defense uh, and back then it was unheard of at the time so um, you have uh, one of the first uh, judo instructors at the time uh, who was Brazilian not Japanese by the name of Mario Alexo uh, he's he founded the uh, judo training program in Brazil for average citizens around 1913 uh, Mario is another person that we will cover in another video so um, you have let's talk about Maeda so Maeda arrived in Brazil uh, on September of 1914 and he started uh, and he was based in Belém in October of 1915 and he continued touring so um, he formally started teaching in 1916 at the Pesandu Sport Club. So um, he started teaching. So there is evidence that he taught mainly five Brazilians were going to get to them. So um, they were, he never awarded anyone a rank of black belt or shodan. So in an interview in 1928, he said that he never awarded anyone a rank of black belt in Brazil. So uh, he actually promoted people to first rank according to Portuguese translation, which I would assume is first Q or the brown belt. So because let's back up a little bit. So in 1883, Kano Sensei uh, came up with the uh, Q and Dan uh, ranking. So uh, back then, the old jujitsu, they would just get Dan grades. There was no... Uh, like specialization or a differentiation between those who are not black belts. They were just either Q or they were just either done or nothing at all. So uh, later became Q and done. Uh, Q, by the way, it's uh, very formal and very popular in Japan. For example, there are Q grades in uh, logical board games. So they had the um, uh, Q and then done and then later on Q became uh, the 6Q which is Rokyo, Gokyo, Yonkyo, Sankyo, uh, Nikyo and Ikyo. So you, you go from 6 to 1st Q or 1st rank. So um, he mainly promoted people to 1st rank or brown belt at the time but there was no colored belts in the 1910s um, 
or 1920s. The early evidence of colored belts was actually in 1922 in the Budokai in London. So it wasn't in Brazil. So mainly people were wearing white belts and black belts. So Maeda would wear his black belt and his students were the white belt. So on June 19th, 1920, uh, it was he promoted four of his students to uh, brown belt or first Q. So uh, it was mentioned in the local newspaper of Estado do Parra. It says that the students congratulated were uh, Guilherme de la Roque, Mateos Pereira, Valdemar Lopez, uh, Rafael Gomez, and of course, Jacinto Ferro. So um, notice there's no... Uh, Carlos Gracie, but that does not exclude strictly that he wasn't his student. It just means that on that day, uh, Guilherme, Mateos, Valdemar, uh, Rafael, and Jacinto were promoted. So he was still probably, I don't know, third, fourth, but uh, later evidence came forth to show that uh, he was not his students. We'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. So uh, we all know, of course, that the teachers of Carlos were Donato Pires and Jacinto Ferro. So uh, he also, Jacinto also taught Donato. So um, there is also mentioned in several articles from that time that in the, the early 1920s, late 1910s, um, st senior students were uh, helping or assist assistant instructors of Mitsuyo Maeda. For example, when he went to Cuba, he was... Uh, welcomed back to Brazil by none other than Jacinto Ferro. So uh, there's also another article from Estado do Para, or uh, if I'm not mistaken, Estado do Paran. Uh, on June 26, 1921, it says that there was a show and there was a jiu-jitsu demonstration uh, at Campo de uh, Recreativa in Belém. So Professor Conde Coma, or Maeda, Mateos Pereira, and Jacinto Ferro would be in attendance. And also it says that uh, Ferro and Pereira being senior members of Maeda's academy. So they were most likely the, the assistant professors. So it is very likely when uh, Gastao said, please, you know, teach my kids. Uh, he would probably said in 1917 that uh, I'm still touring the country, but I'll give you uh, one of my best students, which is Jacinto at the time. So uh, it also says that Donato Pires and Oscar Gracie, students of Professor Jacinto Ferro, would be performing a demonstration of Jiu Jitsu. Uh, however, back then in Belém, there was only one Gracie, and that was Gastao and his son. Carlos so probably the Oscar was a uh, mispronunciation or sometimes the writers got a name wrong they someone told them the names and they were wrong it happens back then the communications were very poor compared to today you know the phone was new there was no internet you know send a text message uh, to fact checked so it's very easy to confuse a name with Carlos to Oscar so um, so for example there are radical historians that said Carlos never even met Maeda, but uh, now we know this is not true from the Estado do Parra article. Uh, it says that in the same night, uh, you had uh, Donato, you had uh, Mateos and Jacinto and Maeda. And of course, Donato and Carlos were performing. So they were at the same event. So 100% they met. Uh, you can also say from the Estadio do Parra article that let's not exclude the uh, probability that Maeda taught Carlos. He probably taught him, uh, but not to the extent of uh, Jacinto or Donato after he moved out from the Belém do Parra in 1923 so or 1921. So... Um, uh, they probably have met. They learned. He learned a bit from him, but he was not his full-time uh, instructor. And also, let's not exclude uh, the idea that uh, he probably taught him, gave him a few cues. But on that day, uh, on June in 1920, only four were uh, or five were promoted to brown belt. So, but later on, more evidence came up that. Uh, uh, the interview of both Horion and Helio uh, where they stated that Carlos never uh, 
trained with Maeda. So that could probably be family spite or something to uh, discredit him, maybe possible. But here, according to uh, old articles, it is very probable that they, uh, not only they met, but also he learned under Maeda, but not uh, a full time student because. Maeda remembering uh, from the uh, Satake stories, the other Japanese judo master and uh, Maeda, they were all the time touring until Maeda settled in Belém do Parra. So um, here it is very possible that they trained together, but not a full time student because Maeda was simply touring. Now, is it possible uh, that uh, Horion and uh, Helio Elio were saying stuff just to you know, undermine the history of Carlos, probably because there was inner family feuds. That's also possible. And it's also possible that they told the truth. So uh, we can never know, but we could at least uh, come to the conclusion that uh, he they met 100% and he learned a little bit from him. Maybe they were uh, preparing for demonstrations. He gave him pointers or uh, at the night or the nights or the days leading to the demonstration uh, or the... Uh, show here uh, in Belém, Maeda supervised the training of Carlos in order to do that demonstration. So did he train on him or met, uh, did he train under him? I would say uh, yes, full time, not so much. So if you have anything else to add, let me know down below. Also, just so you see how fragile our history is, because uh, even something that happened 20, 100 years ago, we're still having uh, difficulty to spread what actually happened and there's so much misconceptions and misinformations and folklore of something that happened a hundred years ago for example something that happened a thousand years ago of course there is a lot of folklore but something as recent as 1920 we're still debating about it we're still going back and forth about it is in my opinion astonishing so i'm glad that myself and professor robert drysdale are uh, playing a huge role in showing the importance of history uh, of judo jujitsu so uh, also please check out the link below simon bjj he is a helsing gracie black belt he compiled a few articles and wrote himself uh, about the sources of uh, mario alexo uh, yacinto ferro and uh, Sada Miyako, one of the first uh, jiu-jitsu masters to go to Brazil, also a forgotten name. So uh, if you have, please check out the link below if you want to read more. Uh, and in the comments section, if you have anything else to say, let me know down below. This was Shadi and thank you for listening.